everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Mihai. And uh, first of all, uh, I hope you all know uh, Unix. <laughs> I'm not inviting you to kill the speaker, but uh, I'll be very glad to take interruptions at any time during this talk. Um, do you have any questions? Okay. So this talk is about uh, incremental computation. So what is incremental computation? First, I'll give you an informal view. And then on the, about the midway point to the talk, you will actually know exactly what it is. So let's say you have a program and you compute something based on some input, and then you change your input a little bit. And then uh, what you'd like is uh, not to recompute everything. Hopefully, you can just change your output. So that's what incremental computation is. In general, it's very hard to define precisely, but it works really well for databases. Because in databases, you know, the tables have a natural notion of a change, assertion, or deletion. And the, if this computation is a query, the output is another table that also has a natural notion of a change. And changes are really transactions. And uh, also in databases, often the tables are much bigger than the changes you apply to them. So that's why it's really handy. And in fact, database people have known about this. They call it incremental view maintenance. It's a problem old for 30 some years. But despite that, I think we still brought some interesting uh, insights into it. So this talk has two parts. The first part has nothing to do with the software. It's really about uh, how you should think about incremental view maintenance. And I want to argue that uh, incremental view maintenance is a streaming uh, computation by nature. And second, I will tell you how we use the Apache call site to very quickly prototype this into something that is working. And I will also uh, discuss about, about call site. So if you want to know more, actually, this paper was just published at VLDD. They were kind enough to give you the best paper award. Oh, yeah, very kind, very kind. Perfect. Thank you. So what is in the paper? So the, the paper really is a very simple language called DBST, which stands for Database Stream Processor or Signal Processor, if you want. It's so simple, it only has four operators. And uh, using this language, you can give a definition of what it means to do incremental computation. And then we have something nice, which is uh, if you can give me an arbitrary DBSP program, I can give you another program which computes the uh, on changes directly, the incremental version of the same program. And uh, besides that, we also have a recipe. If you give me a database query, we know how to implement it in DBSP. So you need actually two operators to do all of SQL. And uh, if you want to do recursion, you need two more. And uh, what happens? Uh, the, what happens is the following. This language can express essentially everything you need to do with SQL. So you can do relational operators like you know, oscillation projections, join. You can do computation on bags or sets or multisets. And uh, you can also handle nested relations that you generate with using group by and unnest, which is the universe of group by. You can handle aggregations, can handle it. So all of this is uh, the base of SQL. Then you can do stuff like the, uh, you more easily express in data log. SQL has some limited recursion capabilities. You can do recursive monotonic and non-monotonic recursion. You can do stratified negation. But the beauty is that no matter what you write, we can tell you how to evaluate it incrementally. In fact, we give you an, an, a program which will evaluate the same thing incrementally. And now I'm going to explain now how it works. It's actually surprisingly simple. So uh, the core idea is to operate on streams. And think of streams as infinite vectors indexed by time. And uh, this is a stream of numbers, but anything can be in a stream. Now, because we want to work with changes, we need the notion of a plus and a minus. So minus is the difference between two data values, and it's usually a change. And the plus is the opposite, adding a change to a data value. And we want also a notion of a zero for the um, no, no change. And in fact, we ask you that whatever data you have, it should have nice uh, properties mathematically. And But it turns out it works very well for databases. So don't worry about it too much. Now, if you have streams, streams are indexed by time. They also have stream operators. So, you know, this is the streaming session. Maybe I shouldn't spend so much time. So Q is a streaming operator. The input is a stream, the output is a stream. You can have uh, streaming operators with multiple inputs. And all our streaming operators are synchronized in the sense that you feed an input or a set of parallel inputs, you get one output. And then you feed the next input, you get the next output. But an input, remember, can be a big change, can be a, a transaction that you apply to a database. Oh, yeah. So how can we build such streaming computations? There's a very simple way to build streaming computations. If you give me any function on the data type you compute on, I can lift it, and then again, I, now I can apply it to a stream. So given a, a 
scalar functions, we can build stream functions very easily. That's very natural. Some people call this map. Okay, another way you can build streaming computations is if you have primitive streaming computations, you can chain them using uh, you know data flow graphs. That's also something that people do a lot. Now let me show you an interesting operator which is uh, different from in the previous one. You can't express this using just uh, the, the two combinations previously. So this is the delay operator. The, it has a funny notion z to the minus one power, which comes from the signal processing of the literature, where this whole theory was inspired from. And it's a very simple operator. Given a stream, it just puts a zero in front and then gives you the stream. So this actually has a memory, right? It has to remember the, the, the previous data value and the output is in the next clock cycle. And the zero, you know, I, I ask you if you did that type to have a zero, so that's the zero that you're going to put in front. Okay, so this is the everything we need. Now let's start to build some nice circuits out of it. So this is a cute circuit. Uh, what it does, it, it takes an input stream, delays it, negates it, and adds it to itself. So uh, some of you might have seen this previously, but you can still answer the question, what, what is this computer? Okay. That's that's right. This actually computes differently. So if you write a little equation, you know the teeth output will be the previous, the current input minus the previous input. So this is just computes changes or deltas. Right. So you feed a stream of data, you get a stream of changes. Here's an example. You know, you feed the numbers, you get the difference between consecutive numbers. Looks pretty nice, but it's it's good that we can compute on deltas using this operator. Now let's do an even simpler seemingly operator which only has two boxes. We take the, pre the output, delay it, and add it to, it to the current input. So this is bizarre, you know, because uh, somehow the output depends on uh, itself, but because it depends on the previous version of itself, this is well-defined. So if you want to guess what this is doing, that's right. So you can just write an equation, you'll see the current output is the previous output plus the current input. And if you just expand the sum, you'll see that the current output is the sum of everything you've seen so far. And we call this the opposite of the previous operator. So we call it the integrator. And it has this nice property that you give me a stream of deltas. It gives you back the original stream that you started from. So really, what I'm telling you is that these two operators, the I and the integrator and differentiator, are, are inverses of each other. You can always combine them, and they will cancel out. And one of them computes deltas from a stream. The other one co reconstitutes the stream from the deltas. And now I want to shock you. I hope I will manage. I'll claim that all databases, not uh, you know, just Flink, for example, are streaming databases. I have claimed that MySQL is a streaming database. So let's just take a database. What is it? It's a set of tables, right? So what is a transaction that you commit? A transaction is set of changes to the database. It's essentially a change to multiple tables of the database. So if you remember uh, the property that makes transactions as nice, that they are linearizable. So you can put them in a stream and say which transaction happened before the other ones. So this is the stream of transactions that will apply to your database. We call them T0, T1, T2, and so on. OK, now the database is not a big, fat, immutable object. In fact, the database is a stream of database snapshots. So the first database you have there is the one you started with. But then each database is the database after applying the previous transactions to the, the database. So there is a very tight relationship between those two streams. The database stream is the, inter in, is the integral of the transaction stream. You just add up all the transactions, right? Very simple, very clean. So that's the first thing you have to remember. So database is really a streaming system that integrates transactions. All right, now uh, views, you can define database views. So for example, this is a view written in SQL, create view, view as some function of a table T. So, what I'll tell you is that this view, in fact, is a lifted query. What does that mean, really? So it means that every time you change your database, you get a new version of the view, right? You apply some transaction, you have the database. For that database, you have a version of the view. So what it means is that, in fact, if you think about the stream of database you've been thinking about, it really corresponds to a stream of views. Each view is the query applied to the current version of the database, which was the lifting operator, if you remember, right? So applying each a function to each value in a stream is lifting the function. Okay, so the views themselves, you should think of streams. If you think of databases as streams, you should think of views as also a stream. They're streams of view snapshots. Okay, now we'll put together those two pieces we've seen. So remember, a view is a stream of uh, queries applied to a database. 
And the database itself is the integral of a stream of transactions. And then we'll do one more thing. We'll apply a differentiator to the view and we'll get a stream of changes to the view. So what this system computes, and I've shown you how to build the system, right? It's built out of very, very simple operators. Given transactions, it gives you changes to your view. And uh, given a query queue, we call this the incremental version of the query queue. So what does this do? This, this is what we think the right definition of incremental view maintenance should be. As a system that computes incremental view maintenance should be given changes to the input, and the system should give you the changes to the output. That's it. And the, usually when people in databases talk about IBM, they omit this last step. They, they, uh, they, uh, they think that the view is what you have to provide. We actually claim that what you have to provide is the changes to the view. And there's two reasons. One is that um, in, this, this, uh, this, the, in this definition, everything is a change. The inputs are changes, the output are changes. And now this becomes compositional. You can actually chain systems that compute on changes and uh, they all behave in the same way. And also another reason why this is better is because the view might be very large, but the changes to the view can be small. If you really want to compute in, in time proportional the size of the change, you shouldn't give the whole view and let people you know, grab to it for what they need. You should tell them exactly what changed. Okay, so. The, given a query, a query is just something that you apply to a database at some point in time. An incremental version of the query is a streaming system. It's being fed a stream of changes. It computes a stream of changes. But what is very important is, although your initial query was stateless, you would apply it to each version of the database, the incremental version of the query is, in fact, a stateful system. It has state inside. And that state, where is the state? The state is actually in the delay operators. Remember I told you the delay operators have to remember the previous value, that's the state. And there's no other place where the state is. This is the only stateful operator. So this is also nice because if you have a stateful system, you know all the places where state is. And it's technically, if you checkpoint that state, you can restore it and then it's as if you never stop. Okay, so a streaming system is a streaming as a system that runs forever, maintains internal state, and uh, all incremental view maintenance systems are streaming systems. Sure, you shouldn't think of incremental view maintenance as something that you do for one step. It's something you do forever. And once you do that, you actually get a lot of uh, nice benefits. Okay, so let me, uh, maybe this looks familiar. Uh, there is a, this actually shows up in database in many guises. For example, uh, there's something called change data capture in which people, so people use uh, something similar to replicate databases. They use the bin log to copy databases from one place to another or they use change data capture in order to stream selective changes from a database to another. These are actually the same thing in these guys, right? So you have the transaction stream at the input, you have, but these are different serializations of the same format, which sometimes are very inconvenient. We claim that this is actually a historical accident. And in fact, people should define a format for streaming changes in and out, and that's what should be used everywhere. And a service provided by a database should be, I'm defining this view, please uh, notify me every time this view changes. So we think that this is the right way to, to do it. Hopefully someday it will be done. Okay, so now I, I've told you how to define incremental view maintenance, but I didn't tell you why it's useful. So this view is very useful because we actually can do it to compute much faster than by just running the query. So if you just do it the way I described, you essentially compute it, uh, aggregate all the data, run the query, then compute the differences. You have no benefit. But it turns out that often we can compute directly from input to output. And this is enabled by a very interesting rule is this one. If you have to, a query applied to the output of another query, then you can, and you know how to incrementalize each of the pieces, you can just incrementalize each of the pieces and get the correct result. And this, the proof is so simple that I'm gonna show it to you now. So uh, it's a proof by picture. So the, the first line is the, the right, the left-hand side of the equation, right? Remember what is the, incremental version of a query is just applying an integral in front and the differential of the output. All right, so that's what I've done in the first picture. Now, remember that D and I, they cancel out, so we can stick a pair in the middle. That pair amounts to nothing, right? So uh, we took the edge in the middle and we stuck a D followed by an I, that does nothing. And now we just reassociate. We group the first D on the left-hand side and the, the second I on the right-hand side, and where we get the right-hand side of the equation. That's it, that's all. 
So this is another benefit of computing directly on changes. You can do this kind of manipulations where uh, what fl flows on the edges is uh, uh, changes. Okay, so what I told you is, what does this mean? It means that if you have a set of operations and you know how to incrementalize efficiently of, of these primitives, you can incrementalize any query that you can write using those operators. And in fact, for everything you need to write SQL, we know how to incrementalize those operators efficiently. Okay, so let's do this. Let's apply this to a real database. So first of all, uh, remember, it looks like I'm shifting the discussion because they said we need a plus or minus and a zero. There's a database don't have a plus or minus and a zero, but it's not that difficult to make them have a plus or minus and a zero. And to do that, you actually have to generalize the database from tables to something called Z sets, which is an internal generalization multisets. In fact, you know, the, today databases are multisets. So when you compute SQL, you can get duplicates. So this is not such a big stretch. So what the multi, uh, what the Z set is a, is like a multi set, but each row has an additional weight. <clears throat> the weight will be an integer number; it can be negative. So it will tell you this weight tells you how many times the row is in the database. So if the weight is three, it means you have three identical rows in your table, but the rows can have negative weights. And then think of them as saying, "I would like to subtract this row to delete it from the the database or from a specific table." And then uh, you can represent sets, uh, one Z set which has only one values is a, a set, and a Z set which has only positive values is a multi set. So you can represent all objects that uh, you can represent in SQL. And beautifully, this actually do form a commutative group. So there's a plus and a minus, which are very natural notions for these tables. You just match the rows and add the weights. That's how it works. And uh, it turns out that, you know, this is a table. I, I won't have time to go into it, but for all the SQL, for the, all the relational operators, it shows you how they can be implemented using uh, Z sets. So we know how to implement you know, selection, projection. In fact, most of them are trivial. Selection, just do selection as usual and then copy the weight from the input to the output. It's very easy. Projection is the same, just a filter and then whoever is filtered, you keep the weight as it was. And some operators actually uh, uh, require a distinct I, which I haven't defined, but distinct is used in databases too, right? So uh, when you do a select distinct, you have to eliminate duplicates. And uh, we do know how to efficiently incrementalize distinct too. So the fact that distinct shows up in your computation is not a problem. So the blue ones are distinct, and then every, every other operator turns out they are called linear or bilinear, which means that they essentially have a very, very efficient implementations. Okay, this is the algorithm. This is a complete algorithm, which has no heuristics and no parameters which is given a query for a database and gives you the incremental version of the same query. So first, you have to implement your query to compute on Z sets, not on databases, but you just use this recipe here. For each of for each primitive operator, you know, we know how to do it and just put them together. Then you can eliminate some distinct calls, but this is an optimization that you can do in standard uh, databases as well. And then, then you start to compute on streams. So remember, this was a query that computed on tables. Now we lift it, and now the query that we get will compute on streams. You give it uh, different versions of the input, and we'll compute different versions of the output. And after we lift it, we can compose it with those two operators, the, the integral and the differentiator. We, we sandwich it between those two. And now we, what we've gotten is the incremental version of the same operator, but which computes on streams. Remember, the incremental version doesn't make sense on, on tables. It always computes on streams. And then using the rules that I just showed you, the, uh, the chain rule, we call it, we can just take any sequence of incremental operators and replace it with their incremental versions. So here's an example. Uh, so I took a query, which is uh, two distinct, two identical arms. It's a selection uh, project, uh, pro filter followed by a join. So you build this graph. So this is what uh, any SQL compiler would do. And this is, in fact, why we use calcite. And then you eliminate some distincts. This is a standard algebraic rule. Then you're left with a little query, which has only one distinct. This is optional. You don't have to do that. And now we take this, this plan and lift it. Lifting it means you just apply it to strings. So you just put an arrow in front of everything, an up arrow. You don't do much. And then. We incrementalize it by putting integrals in front and differentiators at the end. 
And now this will compute on changes. So these two are not equivalent. The middle one computes on, on data, the, the bottom one computes on changes. And now we optimize this by converting everything to its uh, incremental version. And it turns out the incremental version of a uh, selections and projection is the same as selection and projection. And in the end, you get a circuit like the one at the bottom, which is looks complicated, but is the incremental version on the of the initial query. And this one will compute in time proportional to the size of your changes. It's much more efficient than uh, the original one. Okay, so uh, how did we build this? We used CalSight. So CalSight, this is actually a straight copy from the CalSight uh, uh, webpage. If you don't know about it, you should learn about it. It's a really a very powerful framework. It's a framework, it's not a compiler, right? It's a framework which gives you a lot of tools to parse SQL, to validate it, to type check it, to optimize it, it has uh, all sorts of tools. And um, it, it really made, enabled us to build a compiler for this uh, streaming uh, computations in uh, only a few months. So now our compiler, the target is a library, the DBSP library, which is, uh, we happen to implement it in Rust. The code is available as an MIT license on uh, crates.io. And it has essentially all the primitive operators that you need to implement uh, SQL. And then we brought a compiler. The compiler is also open source using an MIT license, which can uh, has two backends, but uh, it's really based on concept. And how do you express a streaming system? So that's the beauty. If you want to do streaming computations, you don't need to know anything more than SQL. And unlike many other systems that do streaming computations using SQL, we will in principle reject no, no query that you write. So we can do anything that you can express in SQL in streaming mode. So you express your query as a set of tables, which are inputs and views, which are the outputs. And then this becomes, each table becomes an input to your system. Each view becomes an output from your system. And then you keep feeding changes to your tables and then the system will give you changes to your view. That's how it works. And uh, you know, the, the, few, the queries that define the views, they become essentially the, the computation in the graph. And the compiler is based on CalSight. The front end is uh, all CalSight. And then we convert to a different representation on which we incrementalize and optimize. Now, uh, it's all implemented in Java. In principle, we actually could have probably done everything in CalSight, but when I started this project, I actually wasn't familiar with CalSight. So I chose to, to work with concepts that I know very well myself. So, I'm, so I had to write them myself. CalSight is very, very powerful and flexible. I needed only a little piece of that. And we have two backends. So in one mode, you generate Rust, and then there's Rust you link with two things. You link with the DBSP runtime, which has all these primitive operators that do incremental computations, and you link with the SQL runtime. So you know SQL is a language, but it comes with a large baggage of functions and operators, and uh, those you write separately in Rust. And then you get an executable, and this executable you stream to it changes for the inputs, and it will stream to you changes to the outputs. Or Turns out that the Rust compiler is very, very slow. So if you do this, most of the time it will be spent compiling. Alternatively, we have a just-in-time compiler, which is based on Crane Lift, which is a framework which was designed for WebAssembly initially, in which we essentially generate an assembly language representation of your program, which is encoded as JSON, and you can just directly execute that. It's much the latency is much faster to get started. Okay, so a little uh, about CalSight. So what is the hardest thing about building a compiler? Uh, there's many hard things about being a compiler, but I think actually the most tedious one is testing. I think if you want to have a compiler with which people will trust, you have to write a lot of tests, a lot of tests, you know, hundreds of thousands of tests. So I'm not kidding you. It's not uh, a thousand tests is nothing for a compiler. And uh, I don't think CalSight has enough tests today. And partly I think it's by design because they want the test suite to run very fast. Uh, you know, the more tests you have, the more it will take. So uh, it has several, uh, it has slow tests and fast tests. But uh, I think many tests I, I discovered they do not cover enough corner cases. So uh, we contributed a few pieces. So uh, there's this uh, psychologic test uh, project, which is part of SQLite, which is uh, an open source also as well. And uh, they actually use the fuzzer, I think, to generate about 7 million tests. They are random queries. And for each query, they have an output or a, a way to very validate the output. And uh, we actually uh, converted this to Java, and uh, it's a separate project there in Hydromatic. Uh, uh, Julian was very kind to uh, uh, host it there. 
And uh, based on this project, we wrote uh, a framework which tests CallSight. So this is a generic Java framework for, to run the SQLogic test, but it turns out to, with a few lines of code, you can apply it to CallSight. And it, it's now a CallSight test, but it fails in many places. So uh, it's not run of, as the regular test suite. So we, we will have to file the, to analyze the bugs and file uh, and, and fix them one by one. But one bug can have many uh, instantiations. So you know, when you run 5 million tests, so that's a lot of work to, still to be done. But uh, I want to mention that in our project, we have managed to run all of this test suite entirely without any failures using CallSight. So there are pieces in CallSight that uh, certainly work very well. We just have to figure out, uh, uh, so you can co combine and mix and match them. So not all of them have been validated this way. And that's another very hard problem when you have a framework which allows you to combine parts in many ways. And another thing we're doing is the Postgres test suite. There's another open source project, which has a very nice uh, test suite called Regress, which has 240 SQL files with SQL statement. So we are actually porting those uh, uh, to our compiler and running them. And uh, unfortunately, you know, CallSight, although it's being very flexible, it's not infinitely flexible. So there's some things you can write in Postgres you can't write in CallSight. So each test requires some manual validation, uh, but it uh, still is very useful. So we found quite a few bugs in CallSight this way. Uh, and then when I say CallSight, you know, as I say CallSight has many pieces. For example, uh, CallSight allows you to specify the behavior of each function. And some bugs are just in the specifications, uh, like, you know, a function like would be uh, regular express and matching. So it could be a very complicated function. And then uh, I, one way I think that uh, you can uh, generate a lot of tests for CallSight quickly is CallSight has a lot of tests, you can reuse them. So CallSight uh, starts from SQL, then parses it to a representation called SQL node, and then has some tests there. Then it uh, converts this, rep this representation is not validated. It's essentially a syntax tree. Then you convert it to a relational representation, and uh, that representation you can analyze and optimize. That's type inference in the meantime. And uh, uh, there's a lot of tests at this level. And then there's an optimizer which operates on the same representation. And there's a lot of tests on this uh, representation as well. So one thing we found is that you can actually go back. So you can take one of the representations, there's uh, conversions that go back and then you go forth again. So you go take a test, uh, parse it, unparse it, and parse it again, and then run it. And sometimes it will fail. And this will actually find bugs in uh, any of those errors uh, that are implied. And then you can do this, this thing too. So you can uh, go from the relation representation back to the SQL. And then uh, it turns out actually we found a lot of bugs here. I, I haven't even filed all of them. And, and you can do it even this way. So you can optimize and then go back to SQL and then compile again. And this doesn't require writing any new tests. The beauty of this is that all the tests that exist, we're just running them through more stages of the compiler. So I'm, uh, I mean, the process, I contributed one of those as a patch and uh, the other one uh, I'll, I'll uh, contribute uh, when uh, I filed more of the bugs that uh, I discovered. Okay, so uh, that's, so let me, let me summarize. Uh, this was uh, maybe a little too math heavy. So uh, what's a streaming system? It's a streaming that runs forever. And uh, it turns out that uh, you can think of a database as a streaming system. A database is the integral of, the, of all the changes you've seen so far. And the, a transaction is really a change in a database. They are, they are the, the same kind of objects as what I'm talking about. And the, the right definition of incremental view maintenance should be this one. I give you a view. You, the database should give me, every time I make a change to the database, you should tell me what changed to the view. And then with this definition, an incremental view maintenance system is actually a streaming system. And moreover, any query that we know how to write has an incremental, efficient incremental implementation. And the algorithm to incrementalize the query is very simple. Compile your query to a query plan, optimize it using any standard query plan optimizer, and then for each operator in this plan, replace it with the equivalent incremental uh, operator. And there is a recipe to compute those for, uh, the, for SQL at least. For recursive queries, we can do recursive queries. Recursive queries, they sound scary, but they're actually what people call graph queries. They are very handy. People usually build uh, special purpose graph systems. Now SQL has uh, some uh, graph extensions. I haven't looked carefully into it, but uh, this works very well for graph queries as well. So we'll have to see. Uh, I haven't implemented that part in the using the CallSight framework. Okay, so we built, we're contributing all the pieces I talked about as open source. They are not uh, clearly or not all Apache projects, but uh, 
I don't know, maybe we, we chose the MIT license. Maybe there was a mistake. I don't know if this would be an obstacle. Maybe they can be relicensed. I don't know, I don't know. But it's open, so you can feel free to, to try them. And uh, if you have any uh, any uh, streaming problem that you can't express using the existing systems, I think you should give the, our system a, a try. Now, this Feldera, last time I gave this talk, I, my affiliation was VMware Research. In the meantime, uh, we suck at, uh, <clears throat> we convinced some venture capitalists in uh, giving us some money. So we uh, actually created the startup and uh, we are building this, uh, we're trying to build a product out of this. Okay, so so if, you, if this was too much for you, so just take a picture of this cube. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that uh, databases, streaming systems, and incremental view maintenance are very, very tightly tied together. They are not bizarre objects on the landscape of database. They are really the same uh, facets of the same cube. You can't separate one from the other. And I think actually thinking in this way, many problems that today require custom systems in streaming can be simplified. I actually claim that uh, there will be a shakeup in this space, uh, but I've been wrong before, you know. So uh, that's how, this is my prediction. Uh, I, I claim there will be a shakeup, and then what will happen is that uh, streaming systems and databases will uh, unify to a de some degree. You know, there's this paper that says uh, one size does not fit all, and it's true in databases. But I think there's just too many sizes now. And I think we can we can simplify things a little bit. There were no interruptions, so. You have a chance now to say something. Yes. Um, so, and several people just talk normally um, that they go like one word or one event at a time when we hash for it. So it's normally like um, the complication, but so you're doing batches of things that that's not a, a problem. I mean, that, you said that the, everything is your Delta operators. I mean, there aren't any problems, right? Okay, so, so I know it's not really a question there, just to confirm, you're saying, like, I mean, obviously, it's no, none of these SQL operators pose more of a problem than any of the other ones. Your your implementation covers the whole the whole set. Oh, okay, so I several questions. There. So, so let, 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 let me uh, try a rephrase. Uh, uh, so, the first one is about uh, the granularity of changes. So, many systems like Flink, uh, an event is a change. Whereas what I'm claiming here is a transaction is a change. I, I claim that the transaction view is more general because you can always put an event in a transaction. So you can always make events into transactions, but you can't always make transactions into events. In fact, people complain about Flink. It has this problem. You can write, there's a nice blog post. I don't know if you saw it. Uh, you can write a, a query, which just moves uh, data between two accounts. And you can write an aggregation query, which does the balance. The balance of the account should be zero. And you write this in Flink, and then you plot the output which should be a zero line, and it actually goes over the place, all over the place. And the problem is this one: there's no atomic changes. What you would like to know is which changes are atomically happening to your database and to your output view. And I think that's why there should be a transaction: transactions on the output, transactions on, on the uh, the input, and on the output. We tell you what changes in all atomic in all the views that you know. If you want to do one by one, it's okay. Uh, it will work. You will lose this notion. You know, you won't know exactly when to look for the output. That's what you don't know. Now you asked, the second question was whether we can express everything that all these other systems, they have all sorts of streaming extension. If you look, you know, uh, lateness, watermarks, uh, all sorts of uh, tumbling windows. Uh, we haven't implemented all of those. My claim is that in many of them, you actually don't need, or you need them in a much lesser degree than you expect. But uh, uh, I will have a proof of that when it works. Until then, it's only my opinion. Yeah. Uh, I really like this way of doing the data data saving. Uh, well, if, if I have a classical traditional database with millions of millions of records, I want to have uh, one row by primary key. I cannot use a string to represent the data. So, this is essentially like you were saying that I can change the image of a minute. And so. Well, a database is a stream of database snapshot. That's all I said. Yeah. yeah. So, but I cannot say a stream by primary key. No, but you can query a database uh, by primary key. So in fact, this, this whole framework does, so we give you an offset operation, which allows you to specify a primary key. The way you do that 
is essentially you integrate the stream. Remember, the integral of a stream is a table. So the database always integrate the streams. They have the whole table. So they integrate the stream and then they apply the upsert to the table. And uh, that's how you can express, for example, deletion by primary key. You take a stream, you integrate it, then you look up the primary key and you convert it into a min the row that is being deleted with the minus one way. So you get a stream of changes from a stream of uh, upsets. We can, yeah. By this schema, you can schema the time selection data for, because my last days as two years, two years old. And the value that I'm looking for, Okay, so so remember these are streams of Z sets, and the Z set can be a whole table. So you you can look up something in a table at, at one point in time. So this 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 uh, uh, language allows you to do that. So so what you can do is you can a table is the the sum of all the changes you've ever done. So you apply all these changes, you get a table, and then in the table, you can do anything you could do in SQL. So that part is not going to be more efficient than a regular SQL database, if that's what you need to do. But you can do it. Yeah. Is there any way to do this? Or is it actually, uh, is that like, like for example, if the, the stream surface is too slow, or uh, if it's too high, then possible, you can yeah, scale it up or... Okay, excellent question. So, so if you look at the kinds of uh, plans this generates, they are just data flow graphs. And yeah, this is data flow graph. Everything you know how to, to scale up, scale out these data flow graphs works just fine. And in fact, our implementation is multi-threaded right now. So it hash partitions the record. Uh, but I would like to understand, let's say, if you have data, data flow, so it needs to do a key, right? And That's you, correct. Well, I'll be happy to talk about this offline, but I, uh, so, for example, some operators, they don't care about distribution, like selection and projection, clearly you can shard them, right? For joins, <laughs> joins, equi-joins, equi-joins need to bring the data with the same key together anyway, right? Yeah. So for that, you need an exchange. Uh, so you exchange the data based on the hash of the key you're going to join on, and then the join, the resulting join can be hash partition too. So, so for all of those, we know how to do them in uh, parallel. Yes. Yeah, sorry. So you stated that a small input here would be small. But so it isn't. For a small change in the input, the change in the output is usually small. So there are some important cases where this is not true, right? One example um, is uh, a, 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 a search index on the document. You have one document. It contains 10,000 distinct words, and therefore you have to add, you have to do right 10,000 distinct quotations, not meters. And therefore, emitting the deltas is not an optimal strategy because your database is, is, is computing many incremental changes. You, you also gave one query the uh, product to, you know, what are the greatest than average price. You could add one product to the database. You could update one product price and a whole bunch of things would change, right? You update another product and a whole bunch of things change. Yeah. And how do you solve that problem, you know, in, in practical terms? Okay. So the database is not producing, you know, loads of deltas for very small changes. Okay, so the question is, uh, can changes be large? And the answer is absolutely true. So, for example, as uh, Julian pointed, sometimes you can have one record change in the output and the whole, uh, the, in the input and the, the whole output could change, all the records. And then we will be optimal asymptotically, and we won't do more work than the regular algorithm would do. But, uh, you know, uh, maybe as the constant factor would be worse. It might be that if you just did the original query, you would end up better. But we can guarantee for every step that it does the work proportional. It will have a speed up proportional to the ratio between the size of the database and the size of the change. But the changes could be large. and. 
you could have in input changes are smaller, but they could get larger and larger for the, the chain. So that was the possibility. Uh, sorry, he was uh, yeah. waiting. Let's yes. take one more question and then we'll have the copyright. Sorry. So you mentioned about the CDC kept the changes and you took them by two, kept the changes the same, same long. So what's, it, uh, what's your, your uh, algorithm to better than that? Okay, so the question is about the relationship between this and the uh, CDC and bin log. So, so I didn't say that. Uh, uh, so, so what are bin logs used for? They are used for database replication, and uh, I don't think this we, we bring anything new. I, I was just pointing out that uh, bin logs are also a way of streaming out changes to a database. And CDC systems actually try to use the bin log to extract useful information. For example, changes just to a view. And I say uh, the bin log uh, is a hack. I think there should be built-in interface into the database. That's that's all. The only.